Writer Ministries, a ministry of helps, healing, evangelism, love, prayer, salvation. Writer Ministries, an international ministry bringing healing, evangelism, and salvation to the nations around the world. Come and be a part of this growing outreach where you too can learn to preach, teach, and heal in Jesus' name. Writer Ministries is a ministry that declares the kingdom of God is the power of God getting results. Now here's Pastor Let's Robert. Open up with prayer. We're going to believe God for an outpouring of the Spirit of God this morning in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for this time of this morning, Sunday morning message. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to open up the eyes of our understanding. You're going to pour in the revelation knowledge, the illumination, and the comparison of the Word of God. Our spirits are alive. We're ready to receive. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this is going to be a first session of four on the spirit of offense. In Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen. yes and amen. The spirit of offense. God brought this to my heart because I have a suspicion that that spirit has been functioning in your lives, and we're going to put an end to it. And you're going to say, oh, okay, I'm going to cast the devil out. Well, there's more to this because we need to do some investigating and understand what is causing us to do the things that we do. And instead of pointing fingers at people, which is so easy to do, we've got to realize it's not a person that the problem is, it's the devil that's the problem. We've got to be hard on the devil and light on people. It's really easy to be hard on the people and light on the devil. So this teaching is to bring about some things. Now, we're going to open up our Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 16. We're going to start in Matthew. How about that? How about the beginning of the New Testament? Is that a good place to start? Praise the Lord in Jesus' name. <clears throat> now, the spirit of offense is, is a teaching I received from another pastor, but it has so much to do with our everyday lives. And when we're talking about the spirit of offense, we're talking about the prince of the demonic spirits, the devil himself. He is a spirit and he causes offenses. Or have you ever been offended? I ask you to do something. Have you ever been offended? Does this offend you? How many know that you can be so easily offended? You might want to say you hurt my feelings. That's a spirit that's working on you. And people say, oh, man, I don't hang around with him because he's always offensive. Is it really that person that's offensive, or is there a spirit working on you? So we're going to learn that people are not the problem, but it's a spirit. How many are going to be excited to know something? When you realize that there is a spirit of offense and how it functions and how it operates, you're going to say, well, thank you, Jesus. Now that I know how this thing works, in the next four sessions that we have, you're going to take note and you're going to say, whoops, that thing's been working in me. And here I am, quote unquote, called a Christian in church, and I'm allowing a demonic spirit to work in my life. So we're going to get rid of this thing. We're going to teach you what it is. We're going to teach you how it functions, how it works, and then how we're going to get rid of the thing in the name of Jesus. How many are excited about that? I am excited about it because, you know, I don't care who you are, the devil's out there to get you. He has a plan and attack to get you off of God's plan and, and purposes. But we're here to say, no, you don't. No further, Satan. You're bound, and we're making you leave in the name of Jesus. So what I want to do is preach from the Scriptures. We're going to let the Scriptures themselves teach us. And some of you have already got some of the teaching on spirit, soul, and body. Some of you have already got spirit, um, uh, spiritual warfare teaching. Some of you have already got some of this information in you. Some of you do not. If you haven't got the spirit, soul, and body teaching, which is fundamental for most Christians, that is available for you that we have on CD, on audio tape. I would recommend that you get it. Spiritual warfare, if you don't have that, you need to get that. The reason for this, because they're all building blocks and they work together. Now this is a spiritual warfare teaching on the spirit of offense and I want to get this across to you and when you start realizing whoa this thing has been happening to me and you're gonna say we're gonna stop that because it is so easy to look at people's faults isn't it? Why don't you realize it's a demonic spirit that's showing you their faults? Because as far as God is concerned your sins are as far as the east is from the west so why are you looking at people's faults that their, their sins are not there? How can you call this man who God whom cleansed call common? 
So this is why I felt I need to, to teach this. It's also a reminder for me, because you know when I teach this stuff, it brings out more excitement, and there's an anointing. Amen. We're going to start in verse 13 of the chapter 16 of Matthew. Matthew 16, 13. Now, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Now, some of you may not have caught this, but I want to stop and go through these scriptures piece by piece till you get an understanding. When Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? These disciples who've been walking with Jesus started telling them, or started telling Jesus, what people said. Hello. Quit your fidgeting and listen up. God is trying to show you right in this scripture. People say things, and you listen to what they say, and you take it as gospel truth. This is the soul of man, his thoughts, he's, what he's thinking about. This is what's that? No, 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 no. But who say that? Who do you say that I am? In other words, get out of the flesh and get into the spirit and find out what I am. Because you're going to listen to people. Don't go over to so and so's place. They're not quote unquote da 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 da. How many know what I'm saying? And people will steer you off a of track. Because some say, well, he's John the Baptist, some Elias, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Is that who Jesus is? No. But yet, here you are listening to what people say. And you can say it as though it's the gospel truth and it's really your opinion. It's how you say something. People like to hear your opinions, especially when you're selling something. Oh yeah, I used that brand X and it was the best thing I... Oh yeah, well, so-and-so liked brand X, so since they like brand X and I like so-and-so, so I'm going to buy it. But what is your spirit? telling you is what Jesus is saying. Come here with me. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now up till this time, nobody knew that Jesus was the Son of God. And the only time that that came out is when the devil said, I know who you are. Are you come to torment me before my time? You're the Son of God. And Jesus says, Be quiet. How all of a sudden Peter is getting this information. Thou art the Christ. You are the anointed one. The son of the living God. Now this is a revelation. Everybody else is saying, well, he's a prophet. He's, a, he's John the Baptist. He's Jeremiah. But Peter is saying, no, wait a second. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, can I say it in paraphrase, or do you want me to read it? I'm going to read it. Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And today it says, Wow, Peter, you finally got with the program. You're hearing from God. Are you getting this? You, just a few seconds ago, and the rest of your buddies out there said I was John the Baptist. But your spirit finally heard God's voice. You didn't hear it from a man. You didn't hear it from me. You heard it from my Father, which is in heaven. It was revealed to you. It's called revelation knowledge. And now Jesus begins to give him more revelation. See, most people don't see this, but I do. All of a sudden, God starts to show you revelation knowledge in your spirit about things about you, about your church. And then as soon as you start to get revelation because you're sitting in church, you go, oh, more starts to come. Hey, I like to be in a church where I get more revelation. And the more I hear, the more revelation I get. So here, Peter finally hears God's voice. And now he says, verse 18. And if you stop and think about it, these words were never spoken in the Old Testament. Nobody knew it because that they didn't have the revelation that we have today. Here, here's Jesus giving Peter more. How many like to have more revelation? And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So let's stop and think about it. 
it's not the quote-unquote church building that Jesus is talking about because they didn't have a church building where this happened. They were outdoors where Jesus always was. So he says, upon this rock, Peter, which was another name for uh, Petre, uh, for the rock, okay? So Peter, he uses that as a comparison upon this revelation that you hear from my Father in heaven that's coming into your heart. My church is going to build up on people hearing from God through revelation knowledge. Just like you got, Peter. And, and, then, and then Jesus speaks and he says, and on top of all this revelation, I'm going to give you some more. Reason for this is this. He had never heard anything about Jesus being Christ till then. This is so, so exciting. This is so exciting. How many have ever been somewhere and you've got some friends that are your best friends and then all of a sudden one day they open their eyes and they say, I got to get saved. And you get so excited because they get saved. You're excited, I mean, because they're your best friend. They finally give their lives to the Lord. That's how Jesus is feeling. He finally figures out who I am. <laughs> and I'm going to give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, a lot of people use this for binding the devil. You can do a whole lot more with this because this is a key of unlocking something called more revelation. And I'm going to give you this key of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now here, here, all of a sudden, you 12 guys figure out that I'm Jesus. Now I'm telling you, don't tell anybody. Does that make sense? This is what he meant. Don't think as this is common, everyday stuff. I just gave you revelation knowledge, and don't think it's just everyday stuff. A lot of people come to church, oh yeah, they pray for the sick or they get well all the time. It's just everyday stuff. It is not everyday stuff. This is the key to the kingdom of heaven. I'm the Christ. Until now you get nothing except to use it in my name, Jesus said. That's the key. This is revelation. Some of you got to grasp it, some of you won't. Once you realize, well, so don't make this so common that it it has no power in your life anymore. How many like to eat chocolate every day? Well, then when I give you a box of chocolate, it's not so exciting to you because you eat chocolate all Oh, yeah, I get this all the time. It's not a big thing to you. That's what Jesus is trying to tell you. My name, I am the Christ, the Son of God. This is a big deal. Don't make it common. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now, this is an interesting statement, verse 21. From that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Say, from that time forth, that time forth. Jesus did not reveal anything until they got it from God. How would you like to come to church? And I, I don't ever really tell you exactly what it is until you get it from God. How would you like that? You see, this is the 12 guys. They don't even understand why is Jesus here and what am I following this guy for? All I know is I gave up everything to follow this guy. I got a fishing business. I should ought to be out there tending with it. But instead, uh, I let my wife and kids and whoever's there take care of my business. I am following this guy. I don't have no idea why I'm here. I just know I'm supposed to be here. I just got it inside me. But they have no idea what they're doing. Till when? Now. Here he is. Who do men say that I am? Well, some of the, guys, some of the 12 said, well, you're one of the problems. This is what people are talking about. They never even took it to heart to say, what does God say who he is? Now that it's come to light, the 12 heard Peter, the other 11 heard Peter say, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. From that time forth, now Jesus begins to share his plan, his mission 
with the disciples. Hey, listen, you guys finally got this. You figured out who I am. So now you're smart enough to take and eat the hamburger. Before now you've been drinking milk and soda pop, but it's time now to have some steak. You can put your teeth in this, you can chew it, and you're gonna identify that this is good. So I'm gonna give you this. Here's why I'm here. I'm gonna go get crucified. I just gave you a revelation of my destiny, of why I'm here. That's revelation you did not know until today. Now, this is revelation knowledge. They didn't know this. And that's what Jesus is saying. From this time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things to the elders and chief priests, scribes, be killed and raised on the third day. All right, soon as revelation knowledge starts coming, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Here's Peter getting revelation from God. He's the Christ. Now, the, now Christ is giving him more excitement, more revelation. And Peter says, No, you don't. You're not going to go die. Now, wait a second. I just told you my plan and purpose, and you're telling me I'm not going to do this? Hey, Sometimes God talks to people in their hearts by another person and then you don't agree with what they said. Doesn't make you any better or less than that, but it lets you know that you are now being operated by a devil. Isn't this great? No. Then, verse 23, But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now here's your 11 guys, your peers, hearing Jesus tell you that you got Satan in you, calling you Satan, get behind me, Satan, you think Jesus was talking to Peter. Hello? Was he talking to Peter? He was talking to the devil that was in Peter. Peter's not the devil. The devil is the devil. And he says to the devil who's operating in Peter, and he says, Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Thou art an offense unto me. Satan, you are a spirit of offense. So what does that mean? It means that you are like a mousetrap. How many ever know what a mousetrap looks like? A little square thing that's got a spring on one end and it goes over. And then you have the little piece here that holds the cheese and the little thing that holds the spring down comes across and connects into that. And then when the mouse comes over and moves this to get the cheese off this, it comes undone and the spring snaps over and collapses and whack, got the mouse, right? Kills him dead. The little thing that you put the cheese on is called the trigger of the trap. And so when he moves that trigger, bam, it whacks him. So what the Lord is saying, Satan, you're the trigger of this trap that you're trying to get me into by listening to Peter tell me through you that I'm not going to fulfill God's destiny in my life. You're trying to trap me not to do God's will. You're trying to trap me to make me get off God's course. You're trying to pull me aside. And though you're using my best buddy Peter, I recognize that you, devil, are operating in Peter, and I'm not going to listen to you. Now, Jesus was smart enough, because he's got the Spirit of God operating in him, to know that it was the devil and not Peter. Most of us will listen to the devil in a person, in your wife, in your friend, or whatever it is, and you will go and get <laughs> trapped. Come on. I'm going to tell you a trap. You want to hear a trap? You don't want to hear a trap? You want to hear a trap? Let's go live together. You know, I have a job, you have a job. If we went to live together, it would cost us less to live together, wouldn't it? That's a trap. Next thing you know, you're going to have sex. Next thing you know, you're going to have babies and you're still not married. And the Bible calls those little babies bastards. Illegitimate. Do you ever hear the word illegitimate children? They're all over this place. Do you know that it's okay to go live with one another before you get married? How many people know that they're doing that and don't do anything about it? There's a trigger of the trap. Well, Ann Lander says it's okay. Dear Abby says it's okay. Well, the Word of God says it's not okay, but I got two against one, so it's okay. 
No, 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 it's not okay. But people do it all the time, thinking that it's okay. And they fall into the trap. The devil made an offense to you. Does that offend you that I talk like this? Are you getting this? Is there a spirit working? Have you ever been offended by someone telling you the truth? Who makes him judge and ruler over us? Say God. Say thank you, Jesus. How many are with me? All right, so now Jesus exposes the devil and says, you're a, you're a offense to me. You're in the way. Now these other 11 guys, they're hearing the Lord speak that to, the, to Peter. They can't see the devil because he's invisible. So they think he's talking to Peter. Because Peter just heard from God through revelation knowledge that Jesus is the Christ. In the same prayer meeting, right in church, where he heard the revelation that Jesus was the Christ, here comes the devil. In the same, now, Jesus has given more revelation to the twelve. Are they receiving it in their spirit? No. They went right back to their soulish thoughts of what men say, and this is what men would say, you can't do that. I've got to preserve you. I've got to save you. I've got to save the money in case I need it. I can't get rid of you. You're Jesus. You're this Christ. We can't let you die. We've got to protect you. No, wait a second, Peter. You're not hearing me. This is the will of God. And they didn't understand what that did for them until after the fact. So here we got a, a, a spirit that's offensive to Jesus, right? But this offense will get in the way, and it sounds reasonable to save him, not let him die, doesn't it? I mean, would you want your best friend to go die? No, you do whatever you could, but you didn't realize that best friend is going to save your sins, see? So here's an offense. Now, how many of us have been offended? We all have. So these 11 guys that are hanging out with Jesus besides Peter, are, you're like, how do I save them? How do I rescue them? It's real simple. Because when the revelation knowledge is coming, and the enemy comes in to divert that, so you don't receive it, there's only one thing that will protect you. And Jesus is the Word. And He covers the other men with his word. Now what word? Does it matter what Jesus says? But it's his what? Word. His word protects you. So if you got a spirit coming against you, read the word which will what? Wash you with the washing of the word of God, which will cleanse you. Right? So Jesus begins to wash the other eleven with his word. And listen to what he says. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, how many know you have wants, desires, and you have to give it up? See, this is the thing that, that, that sounds contrary, doesn't it? Listen. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life, for my sake, shall find it. There is so much revelation and washing in those two scriptures. And then he adds, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. If you give up your desires for Jesus, you will get your desires. Hello? Yeah. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. I'm not giving my tithes. Excuse me, I got bills to pay. You will lose your money and then you will still have bills to pay. But whosoever will bring his tithe in for my sake shall find more. See, I'm changing the scripture words around, but I want to show you in reality is, I have given my life for the Lord, and for the thing I thought I was giving up, I got it. It's a heart thing. Here is the most exciting gift that God has ever given you, and now he's telling you to give it away.
Doesn't that sound contrary to your heart? You love your, your kids, and now God's telling you to give them away. How could I do that? Do you know how much time and money and effort I put into raising these children? Now I'm just going to give them away? You feel the Jesus was God's son, and he gave him us. That was his best, but can't we give that? that? No, I can't do that. No way. Oh, you have a spirit of offense. That offends you, doesn't it? You can't do that. See, you don't even realize the devil was working on you because you said, oh, no, I, I can't do that. I, I, that's a spirit because you were offended because the word says, give it up. And when you give it up, God sees your heart that you were willing to do it. He gives you a blessing that overwhelms you more than what you had to start with. You thought that a 10-cent piece was the most exciting thing in your life, and you found out there's millions of them. And he gave them all to you. But he won't do it until he sees where your heart is. And your heart has to be totally sold out on Jesus. And when your heart is totally sold out on Jesus you will recognize that the devil is the offender and you can shut him down. So here he is. He turns around and washes the leaven with the word and this word protects them because they just were exposed to the devil's teaching of a being offensive. And because you're not the one but you heard about what this person does, you have the opportunity to pick up that spirit. You might be in a room where so-and-so is being delivered from the spirit of offense, but you're picking up the spirit that just came out of that one. Uh-oh. So, in order to protect you, he washes you with the word, and the word is a shield that protects you from the fiery darts of the enemy and eliminates the enemy from coming towards you. So he protected his 11 men with the word that he spoke, and any word that Jesus said will wash you. Come. Follow me. Washes you. Say, thank you, Lord. So, let's move on, because there's more excitement. Verse 18, chapter 18, verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, what a dumb question after you just got deliverance from, and you just got all of this excitement coming to you. Stop and think. What is this guy thinking about? Hello? Is there pride issues here? Is there a spirit still working in his 11? Hey, this is serious, folks. And Jesus is going to keep, his, keep them, and none's going to be lost to the evil one. And the doubt and all that stuff he has to deal with with his 11 because he's entrusting them to spread the gospel. I'm going to leave in a few days, folks. I ain't coming back. This is what Jesus is saying. You got to get this. And Jesus called the little child. I love this. He likes to use props and all kinds of things for demonstrations. Unto him and set him in the midst of them, this young child. And he said, verily, I say unto you. When he, Jesus says verily, he's saying, wake up, listen up, quit looking down, pay attention. I'm about to give you revelation. When he says, verily, verily, I say unto you. Or verily, I say unto you. Your spirit may go, yeah, yeah. And I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as a little ch children, ye shall not enter, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Huh? If I'm not like a little child, how do I get into the kingdom of heaven? It's so simple. Everybody looking at me, right? A three-year-old kid comes into you and asks you a question. And you answer that question, smart aleck. That little kid is going to take you for gospel truth. Okay? The next kid comes in and asks you a question, and you give him the love and the nurture and the correct and the truth. And that little child is going to say, okay, thank you. You answered a question. Now, when the Lord comes to you, we're his children, right? And if you don't become as a little child to listen to what every word he says because it's truth and you just suck it right in. Because the first little child you told a lie to, do you realize you punctured it, you put a hole in it, you stuck an arrow in it, and after about 10 more of those arrows and a few more of those punctures, he becomes very disobedient. 
And then you wonder why this kid's like this. Well, the other kid is so nice and submissive and loving and kind because you nurtured him with the Word of God. And Jesus is using this child and saying, except you be converted and become as a little children, and shall not, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So this one on this side is so humble and listening to every word I'm saying, and it's going to do it. This one over here thinks I'm still lying to him. Are you with me? And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now this is a word picture. You're not saying take everybody and throw them in the sea. What is the problem with this person He's offended one of the little ones because they're like the gospel truth. They're listening to the truth. And you offended that one. The one who did the offense, it would be better for him if he throw it in the sea. Why? Let's go on. Let's find out. Woe unto the world because of offenses. Woe is not a nice word. Say so your turn's next on the guillotine. Woe is you. Woe unto the world because of offenses. Do you realize there are offenses in the world? Why? Because there's a devil here, folks. He's the spirit. He's the prince of all the devils who's doing this. It's in the world. And woe to the what? World because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Do you realize that you are as bad as the devil when you let the offense come forth out of you and into somebody else? You're the same as the devil. Woe to that person. He says, look, I didn't want to say those bad words. I don't know why I did it. Because he's telling the truth. He doesn't know why I did it. Because there's a spirit motivating him called the spirit of offense. Are you with me? Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, we're talking about offenses, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast in everlasting fire. So, come here, you guys. I'm going to get the knife out and cut your hands off. That's because they're offensive. You pickpocket you, we'll cut your hands off. Is this what Jesus is talking about? I don't think so. This is called a word picture. This is a comparison. It would be better for you if you, if you were a pickpocket and had your hand cut off so you wouldn't be pickpocketing anymore. In other words, we got a problem. You got a spirit in you. It's called a spirit of offense, and you are offending people. You're doing things that are not the truth. Are you with me? It's called improper thinking. You think it's okay, but you didn't check in with God to get the revelation. You thought it was you and okay, but it was the devil influencing you the way you think. And you didn't check in with the Lord. So this is the offense, and you think it's okay to pickpocket. Or you get, I'm just trying to use a picture. He's using a picture here too. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. <gasps> you got two eyes, so we can better pluck your eye out so you don't go to hell. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying you got a spirit in you that's causing you to do something by not doing it. How many know there are a lot of people who look at pornography? Better pluck your eyeballs out so you won't go to hell because you're looking at pornography. Is that what God wants you to do? Pluck your eyes out because you look at pornography? No, you got a spirit that's causing your eyes to look at, so we got to do something with the spirit. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. Say, I'm a child of God, so I'm a little one, and you're despising me. It means that you have a spirit of offense. It's working, and well, who does he think he is telling me what to do? Hmm, sounds like you got a spirit of offense speaking to you. I'm the pastor. I'm not giving my tithes. He just wants my money. Well, doesn't Sears and Roebuck want your money? Doesn't Albertsons want your money? They don't care. They, don't, they want your money more than they want the food. Come on. Don't they want your money? Sure they do. 
Do I? Sure, for the gospel's sake. Amen. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Why is he saying this? By my angels are in heaven. Oh, look, folks, look at me. It's the devil, right? And God's going to send his angels into the world at the last day. And he's going to reap the reaping. He's going to pull out the people that are righteous. Now, these angels behold God, so they're always understanding what righteousness is. Ask yourself, is I one of those people that God's angel is going to come and get? See what he's talking about? But you offended. You let the spirit work in you. So you've got a spirit. They identify. They know what a devil looks like inside of you. Hello? All you have to do is check in with God. He'll show up to you. You got one in you now? Is there the person you're sleeping with at night called your husband or wife? Do they have one in them? What are you going to do about it? Get them delivered. Say, thank you, Jesus. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Say, we all were lost, and he came and found me. Aren't you glad? How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and go into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? Hello? Look at yourself and say, my husband's out to lunch, okay? Should I not go out after him? That's what Jesus is saying, shouldn't I? Even though he's got a spirit of offense in him, should I not go after him? Is he worth it? Yes, the man is worth it. The devil is not. We're going after the man because the devil stole him and taken him away. Are you with me? Okay. And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more than the of that sheep than of the ninety-nine which were not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. Say, I'm a little one. I'm a little one. I am a child of God. I am a little one. And if I have a spirit trying to offend me, then I think you people who are just and ought to come out and save me from this spirit. But you know what people do? Get away from me, you unclean thing, you. I ain't messing with you no more. Get out of here. You're bad. I want you around me. Don't we all do that? Because you're letting the spirit offend you. I thought you were supposed to go out and be like Jesus and save that one. How do you do it? Well, we're going to get there. Say, praise the Lord. Moreover, besides this, verse 15, if thy brother, this goes in the same context as a little child. Okay, you can get the little child, maybe you haven't figured it out, but maybe this one you will. I'm giving you different pictures of the same thing. What are we talking about? A spirit of offense that's offending you. Moreover, besides this, on top of that, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go tell him his what? Fault. Not a sin, but a fault. Do you realize that there's a fault or a crack in this pot? Pretty soon we have cracked pots. Cracked pots are, flaw are flawed. So we have to fix it, don't we? The flaw is that it has a spirit in him. Go tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Brother, I've noticed that you're acting a little strange because there's a spirit of offense in you. When the pastor asked for this, you said you didn't want to help. When that pastor asked you, you didn't want to do this, then you turn around and said, oh, well, he never asked me to do anything. I'd like to be asked. Well, he asked you, and you always say no. So you have a spirit of offense in you, and that spirit's got to come out. I know how to do it. Let me do it. And if he says, okay, cast the thing out of me. So now you were Christians. We should both know how to do this, right? And if he says, okay, let's do it. Then you've gained your brother. You've saved him. Say amen. amen. Now Jesus talked back here in Matthew chapter 16. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the church will prosper, basically, right? Because of this revelation. And the what? Gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We got a gate, 
They're on one side of the gates, the hell part, the other side's not. And you are called a POW, a prisoner of war, and the devil took you into that gate of hell called offense. And you're now offending everything up and down. You don't know why you're doing it. On one side of you, you say, I don't want to do this, but I'm doing it anyway, because you've been captured by the enemy, and now he is torturing you. Aren't you glad that somebody out there loves you enough to want to go get you and bring you back? Well, I don't want to... I don't like him, so I'm not going to let him set me free. See, that spirit's still working in you. I, I just don't have enough experience to cast that devil out. I'm by myself, so maybe I should go to verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So I need to go get two more brothers in the Lord who are established in deliverance. Hello? And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. Did you all know that so-and-so's got a spirit of offense? I don't think that's what this means. I've seen people do stuff that were not nice, and, and they brought them up in front of the congregation of about 500 people and told everybody what they did wrong. Is that what the scripture means? Embarrass the person in front of the whole congregation? No. People will do that because that's what it says, but that's not what it means. Tell it to the church. In other words, who's in the church? We got the pastor, we got the prophets, we got the apostles, we got the evangelists, we got the teachers, we have the elders, we have the deacons, we have the ushers. These people are anointed of the Lord to be a service unto the Lord, and they have the knowledge and the know-how to do it better than the two that you took and by yourself. Bring it to these people. Bring it to the elders of the church. Sit them down, and they will get this man delivered. Because a man is worth it. The devil is not. And the enemy has took him into camp. These guys have got the know-how. Know okay? Now, if you're all privates in the war and you capture an enemy, are you going to interrogate them? You might, but you may not get it as good as two or three of you interrogating you. But if you're not as good as the colonel and the lieutenants who are prepared in interrogation, so you bring them to the elders, and they get the job done. Yeah. See what God is trying to show us? Okay. And if he shall neglect to hear them tell it unto the church. See, love the people, not what they did wrong. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. You know what I say to this? Church, and anyone listening to me, get the knowledge and how to get the man set free. Don't let him get by with nothing. Because that devil is ruining him and everybody around him. Get the devil out of the man. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Wait a second. Wait a second. I heard this over in another chapter. The same words. Why is Jesus saying that now? Because it's the same spirit of offense that needs to be taken care of. So this thing is, I cannot see the spirit because it's invisible. So it's in a heavenly area. So whatever you bind on earth, I am on earth. He's on earth, but I cannot see him because he's in a heavenly place. I'm going to bind him on earth, and he will be bound in that heavenly place. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So I command the person to be loosed from the spirit of offense, and the loosening will happen in the heavenlies. The man gets set free, called delivered. Say, thank you, Lord. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, we are going to come into agreement for this man's deliverance. That settles it. Are you getting this? Anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Now I watched Jesus set a man free in the scriptures whose son was a lunatic. A man came to him and says, you don't even have to come to my house because he's definitely sick. He was set free. A woman comes and says, my daughter is at home grievously vexed of a devil. And he set her daughter free with agreement. And when God said, anything that you ask, it shall be done by my father. And Jesus is in one area and the person's in the other area is getting delivered. Is there any difference today? Because Jesus is alive today, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what he did then, he can do today. And when we come into agreement that that shall be done, then anything that we ask our Father in heaven, it will be done. 
Say, thank you, Jesus. So when I pray for people over telephones or somebody else, it's going to happen. And you guys may not have remembered, but we had so much rain, and I said, no flooding. Look what God did. Turned it around. We got sunshine for now for two weeks. Dries up the ground. We were right there at that stage. Stopped. And I told the mailman, says, do you know I prayed that there would be no flooding and God's going to turn the sunshine? And it was raining the day I said it. The next day it stopped. He just smiled. See how powerful what it is here? When you come into agreement, it shall be done by our Father in heaven. I came in agreement with God. God and me are, are, are two. Jesus and me are two. Amen. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, here I am in the midst of them. So agreement means something to the Lord. How wonderful it is that brothers are in unity together. The anointing of the Lord and you are agreeing on the deliverance of this man because God made the man. God loves his man. He may be doing some stupid stuff out to lunch. Nobody's ever had that problem, right? I'm talking to the right group. But God loves you. Now, he knows the influence of the enemy is doing that to him. When you take away the influence, he won't do that. So us as the church, us singularly, our brother and sister, we go out and set people free in the name of Jesus. Wow, are we getting rid of the spirit of offense? Yes. Is that thing running rampant in the world? Yes. Is it running rampant in the church? Yes. What is the church people doing about it? Oh, I'm going to let the pastor do it. And if the pastor's not up to par doing what God's told him to do, it's never going to get done. So God is raising up in this last time for people, the believers, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, speak in tongues, cast out devils, and heal the sick. Well, you all sound like priests to me. A royal priesthood. So, now Jesus says right here, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, here I am in the midst of them. Do you know how powerful Jesus is? Do you understand the, if we're going to set you free, that Jesus is here and he's going to do the work and we're going to be rejoicing in what God is doing through us? Amen. Amen. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall I, brother, sin against me? And I forgive him. Till seven times? So this is all in the same text. Jesus said to him, I say none of these seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, let me tell you how this works. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened, not is, but like. Comparison unto a certain king which took an account of his servants. And when he began to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. What's my wife worth? What's your children worth? This is a lot of money. This is a lot of value. The servant therefore fell down, worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. When someone comes and offends you with their mouth, with their words, with their actions, realize it's a demonic spirit. Have compassion on the person. Rise above what he's saying to you. Don't let his words kick you down and make you part of it, but rise to the occasion and say, wait a second, this is not right. This is wrong with what he's saying. I disagree, but I'm not going to turn around and retaliate or point my finger at you. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to have compassion on you, and I'm going to forgive you for what you just said and what you just did. But the same servant went out, found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that you owe me. And the fellow servant fell down at his feet, and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. We don't put people in prison because you owe me money today. But we do put them in our personal prison in our heart, and we won't let them out of our heart. So I got a spirit of offense functioning in me because what you did to me and what you didn't pay me back and you this and that, I've got you in here and I don't trust you with nothing. Sounds like you got a spirit working. 
Now, how do we get that spirit out of this person? So, when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, had called and said unto him, You wicked servant. Now you were a nice guy before that. Now you're wicked. You got a demonic spirit working and making you wicked. I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou have also had compassion on thy fellow servant as thou had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentor. Say, that's the devil. Mm -hmm. Till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Okay, let me show you how this works. You come to the Lord. You are a sinner. You are the worst of the bunches of the sinners of the world, even though you haven't done a thing wrong. You are a sinner because you haven't got Jesus in your heart. You come before the Lord. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me in Jesus' name. And the Lord says, I love you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to have Jesus live in you, and we're going to forget all that stuff that happened in the past, and we're going to make you a Christian. Thank you, Lord. I am saved. And you walk out of church. Why? So-and-so owes me money. I'm going to go after him, and he's going to give it to me. And this is what happens. He goes, I don't have the money to pay you. Quit bugging me. All you do is want my money. You're going to have to pay me. Do you realize I gave you that $500 to help you out? You owe it back to me. You never paid me. None of you ever had that problem. You just got saved. And I look out. Are you giving this person compassion? Can you forgive him the 500 bucks? Because if you cannot deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Jesus, as Jesus forgave you of your debt, which you could not pay yourself, and you needed someone like Jesus to take it from you, can you not do that to somebody else? But what you do, you stick him in your heart for 20, 30 years, five minutes, whatever the problem is, and you won't let him out. And you're just going to hang on to the last minute. That's called anger. That's called fear. That's called just a plain spirit of offense. You got offended, you got hurt, you didn't get paid back, you're taking it to yourself as an offense and say that's how the devil works and made you bad and now you're worse than you were before you got saved. Now the Lord's got to get you delivered again because you opened the door and here comes the enemy to take over. Has that spirit ever happened to you? Sure. It's caused you to be grievously tormented by the devil and God says you know what? I'm not even going to deliver you from that devil until you forgive him with your heart. You can sit in your pain. You can be a bad back the rest of your life. Until you forgive, you're not going to get nothing. That's what he says up here. So you better forgive your brother and all the people that hurt you and all the things that they did to you. Forgive him his trespasses. And when you do, you will be healed. And I watched a woman one time sitting right in the front seat of this ministry where, where Benny Hinn and the anointed of God, he's healing people left and right. And this lady's not even closer than Miriam is to me right now, 20 feet close to Benny Hinn's anointing. And when the whole meeting's over, she's still sitting there. I walked up to her, what's wrong with you? I've got arthritis so bad I can't walk. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me immediately and says, tell her to forgive her husband. And I said those words and she got angry. That no good blankety blank guy, the way he treated me, beat me, threw me on the floor, cheated on me, did all that. And God wants me to forgive him. And I said, yes, if you want to be healed. And so with tears in her eyes, she's, I'm in so much pain. And she says, God, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And I forgive him. And immediately, just like that, before my eyes, the woman goes, oh! It doesn't hurt. It's gone. I didn't touch her. Because her heart finally gave up this hurt. And when she forgave of the trespasses, God forgave her. And the forgiveness of God is overpowering. And she was totally healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So I'm going to say to you, if you've got somebody in your heart, let us pray right now and let's set that person free. It doesn't matter if he owes you anything. If he looked at you with a wrong look, cross-eyed look, or whatever the problem was, let's forgive with our heart so we're not captured by this spirit of offense. In our next three sessions, we'll go into depth, but I want you to take this to heart. 
Whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. So loose yourself. Amen. Father, we just declare right now in the mighty name of Jesus for this awesome outpouring of your revelation knowledge on how a spirit of offense functions. We are not going to pull that trigger. We're going to, we're going to diffuse this trigger of the trap, this offense, and we're going to command it to be bound in the name of Jesus. So with our hearts, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, we loose, we let go as a decision of our will in the person of Jesus Christ. We forgive and let it go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And all the people of God said, yes and amen and amen. Robert with Rider Ministries. We'd like to invite each and every one of you to become Rider Ministries' covenant partner. Covenant partners help Rider Ministries go out and do what God has asked us to do, such as heal the sick, cast out devils, you know, the things that Jesus did. As a covenant partner, we'll give to you a new videotape each month that we produce here. Some of these will be on miracles, some will be on speaking to a mountain, others will be teaching how to find God's will, but we're here to help you as you participate in Rider Ministries Covenant Partner. Just send in $20 or more and we'll send you with your seed offering an awesome videotape. We thank you for your help in Jesus' name. Thank you for participating with Pastor Robert in this tremendous teaching. As you practice putting us into place these biblical truths, you will develop your human spirit as a mighty believer for the Lord Jesus Christ. We invite you to join us again in learning God's Word with these awesome video teachings. You can visit us on the World Wide Web for more of God's revelation and biblical truths at www.writer.org.